Well, good morning. It is good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Hear our scriptural call to worship from Psalm 145. The scripture says, I exalt you, my God, the King, and bless your name forever and ever. I will bless you every day. I will praise your name forever and ever. We're going to stand and do just that. Would you stand and join us in singing hymn 668, Doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all the heavenly host. Praise God, Let's sing it again this morning. Welcome you here to First Baptist Church. If you're a visitor here this morning, make sure you grab one of those cards there in the pew in front of you. Fill that out and drop that in the offering plate. It just lets us get to know you a little bit more. If you're watching online with us this morning, we're glad that you're able to watch with us and just join in worship with us this morning. We're glad you're here. Before uh, I came over here to church this morning, I got a text from Brother Brad. He said, just your uh, normal day going uh to the Western Wall and to the to Garden of Gethsemane, just the normal day for him in Israel right now. Uh, they're having the time of their lives. He said that their cup is running over with joy right now. Uh, if you get a chance, get online, get on Facebook, and find their, their profile, and just look at all the pictures that they're taking. They took some this morning of, of the Garden of Gethsemane and the Sea of Galilee and the Western Wall, all this wonderful things they're getting to see. Uh, if you remember him saying... Uh, he said this multiple times, and in his newsletter, he said it, that the only Jerusalem he thought he would get to see would be the new Jerusalem. And here he is this morning in Jerusalem, um, celebrating his 30th year as a pastor, as a lead pastor this morning, on November 3rd. So we, he is excited and happy. He's sad that he can't be here this morning, but I don't think he's worrying too much because he's enjoying himself over there. So again, he says thank you church for sending him there, sending him and Libby, he and Libby there. They're having a great time. As we go to prayer this morning, we want to remember those in our church family who are always uh, needed, who, who are needing intercessory prayer this morning. Remember Mark Wright and, and Bob Osborne, and there's, the list can continue on and on. So let's go to the Lord this morning in prayer and, and, and be the intercessors for these in our church family who need prayer this morning. Father, Lord, we thank you for being able to gather together in your house this morning. Lord, we know there's places here on this earth that can't do this. And we, we take for granted being able to just gather together and worship freely. Lord, we ask that you just be with those in our church family who are in need of a strengthening touch, a comforting touch, and a healing touch. Lord, we ask that you be with our search committee as they continue searching for the one that is to be here at First Baptist. Guide them in, the, in all that they do. Lord, we know that you have the one prepared for our church. Lord, we want to ask that you be with our AMS search committee as they continue to finding the one who will help guide our association and the 10 Mile Association. Lord, be with them, guide them in their search. And Lord, be with us this morning. Be with us as we enter into worship, as we hear a word from the scriptures from your word, Father. Be with us in all that we do. Thank you for your continued grace and for your continued mercy. For it's in your precious holy name that we pray. Amen. 
we're going to stand again, and we're going to join together in singing hymn 339, Standing on the Promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest of His shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. starting in verse 7. The scripture says, But the Lord sits enthroned forever. 
He has established his throne for judgment, and he judges the world with righteousness. He executes judgment on the nations with fairness. The Lord is a refuge for the persecuted, a refuge in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you because you have not abandoned those who seek you, Lord. May God bless the reading of his word.
You crossed the sea to fight a war You didn't know just what would happen, did ya? Stepped in the dirt, boots on the ground And gunfire is the only sound And to yourself you whisper Turn with me, if you will. We're going to be looking at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 this morning. As you're turning there, I'm going to give my thanks of gratitude to you all for having me and your pastor, Banks, as he's on his uh, trip with his wife for entrusting me with the pulpit. You guys have been very hospitable. Thank you, Chuck, man, for what you've been doing. Thank you for leading us so well in worship as well. And so I am Joseph Dix. I work for the Kentucky Baptist Convention as the campus minister at Kentucky State University, and uh, we are blessed. I'm on that campus um, for all the support that the KBC gives us to reach out to our students at KSU. Um, we praise God for the five uh, professions of faith that we've had this year, and we just solicit your prayers that we can help develop those students to grow them in their faith and their maturation, um, and to get them into a local church. So pray for us and pray for our ministry there. And without further ado, let's get into Mark chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8. 1 through 8. I'll be reading from the ESV. And the word God reads as such, Mark 1, 1 through 8. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, 
Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Verse 6, now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, after me comes he who was mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning's rising and last night's lying down. God is by no accident that we are here this morning, but it is the, by your divine providence, Father. And so through the work of your son, Jesus the Christ on the cross and his resurrection, Father, and by the Holy Spirit, Father, we ask that you would empower us and enable us, Father, to hear your word, that the seed of your word, Father, would take root in our hearts, that it will grow and produce a harvest that is right for your kingdom, Father. We ask that you wouldn't allow any distractions as we sit here this morning to choke or to pluck any of it out, that we could focus on your word, that your spirit would help us to mature and grow in our faith and knowledge of you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 1. I would tag this sermon as the life of a forerunner, the life of a forerunner. And by way of introduction, I want to talk about the author of this book real quick. Because the author of this book is John, John Mark that is. In Proverbs 17, verse 17, it tells us that a friend loves at all times and that a brother or a sister is born for times of adversity. And so a good friend, a true friend, according to scripture, isn't one who bails on you when times get tough, but one who, with wisdom, loves you through it all and is willing to walk alongside you as you endure rough seasons that come along with this life. Now, I'm sure if somebody in here uh, this morning may have experienced in their lifetime uh, a broken friendship, a tarnished relationship, communication was lost with a close associate. Now, in the beginning of this friendship relationship, you had trust, you had familiarity, you had genuineness, there was peace. You considered each other a brother and a sister uh, for whom you could call on of times of adversity. However, along the way in this relationship, uh, something happened. I hope you guys are thinking back to an experience that you had. Something happened in this relationship that became a source of division for you. It seemed irreconcilable. It could have been a lie, it could have been gossip, it could have been an argument, Je jealousy, selfishness. Or maybe you just considered this person unreliable. You couldn't trust them. Whatever the case, the two of you were unable to see eye to eye, and so you parted ways. And you even, you haven't dealt with this person since. Has that happened to anybody in here? Everybody's quiet. Has it ever happened to anybody in here? Okay. We're all living, and so we all have struggles, and we've all lost some friendships along the way. Unless we're all in heaven right now, but I don't think we are. And so you had a disagreement, you can't deal with the person anymore, okay? But I can be honest, I've, I've been in that position before. I've been the person that has walked away from people because I looked at them as unreliable and unfit to be a good friend. But I've also been the one that calls people to walk away from me because of some stuff that I've said or I, I have done. And so what's interesting as well is that the writer of this book, John Mark, experienced the same thing. 
and see on his first missionary, missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, verse 13, he's traveling to Pamphylia. John Mark left Barnabas and Paul and returned to Jerusalem. Now, it's uncertain as to why he left, but whatever the reason, his desertion irritated Paul so much that on the second missionary journey in Acts 15, 38 through 40, when Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, Paul strongly opposed it. He didn't want to take him. And this caused Barnabas and Paul to separate. And once a person has shown you themselves to be wishy-washy and unreliable, well, we tend to discount that person. And we don't have anything for them to say to us. We no longer consider their words to be valid. We show a lack of grace. Over time, however, something changed in this young man, John Mark. But not just John Mark, something also changed in Paul. See, Paul's view in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul writes that this brother, John Mark, is now useful for service. And in Colossians chapter 4, and also in Philemon, he calls John Mark. He says, this is one of Paul's key helpers. He is a fellow worker. And now Paul is affirming this brother in his work and ministry. And so I'm sure during this moment of disagreement when they uh, were abandoned by John Mark, Paul could never have imagined during that time that this brother, who he considered unreliable and weak and unfit, would become one of the greatest contributors of the kingdom of God. And have you ever thought that to yourself? That when you have left a person, that when they left you, deserted you, that you could even fathom in your mind that, okay, I know this person is pretty harsh, right now. I know I don't really like them right now, but you know what? In 10 years, they're going to be one of the greatest missionaries, greatest pastors, greatest Christians ever. It's pretty hard to fathom in the midst of it. And so Paul couldn't see that either. But see, a couple of lessons that we can learn from this, just from the author alone, is that number one, we must be careful not to judge. We must be careful not to belittle not to belittle or dismiss people that we or society labels as being unfit or unreliable. Why? Because the Lord in his timing has a way of surprising and humbling all of us. And he'll bring us back full circle where we become beneficiaries of that brother or sister's service. And then number two, those of us who may be in or were in a situation similar to Mark where somebody gave up on us? Well, let me tell you, don't ever give up on yourself. Don't ever give up on yourself. Remain steadfast in the Lord and watch over time how he develops you. Just be patient. The Lord is kind, the Lord is gracious, the Lord sustains, and he maintains that which he has called to himself. Amen. Now let's get into the meat of the text. We see in verse 1 of Mark chapter 1. It said, Mark begins his writing by letting the readers know exactly what he's writing about. See, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. See, the word gospel as we know it now means good news about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But how could and how would that present-day audience in this first century audience, how would they have understood the word? Because the audience that Mark was writing to was primarily Gentile Roman Christians, not Jews. See, the Jews would have understood the word gospel in their context to mean the good news of a sovereign ruler taking his throne, a messianic promise, as in, the king would come in the future and establish his kingdom in Israel. But the Romans, or Gentiles, or the pagans, they would have understood this word in a similar fashion, but without the Jewish connection. See, they understood gospel in their context to mean the arrival of a God, small g, God, but not the true and living God, big g. Or 
they wouldn't have understood it as the coming of a, or they would have understood it as the coming of a real-time ruler like Augustus Caesar. Someone who would rule as the common day emperor, not a spiritual one. But now the question is, we see how they understood it, and we know how Mark is trying to explain it. But this morning, how do you understand the word gospel? What do you understand that term to me? When you hear it, do you only think of music, gospel music? When we hear it or read it, do we just think of the four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Or do you understand it to mean the good news? You see, brothers and sisters, what we think about the gospel and how we understand the gospel and how we apply the gospel will expose your theology and it will determine the aim for your life. It would determine the aim for your life. Because when you misunderstand it, you will misuse it, you will misapply it, and then you will mislead somebody else. Because the true gospel is great, but a false and phony gospel can send someone to hell. And so Mark says that this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus. His term, Yahweh is salvation. He will save people from their sins. Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God, the God, the Son. This is the lineage. This is the meaning of one in nature with God. He's saying that Jesus is co-equal with God. And so now in verse 2 to 3, after telling us what this book is about, Mark then authenticates his message. He gives credibility to his claim of the coming Christ by showing us that what he is talking about was actually spoken of long before him. So he quotes from the book of Isaiah and Malachi, but he doesn't quote a prophecy about Christ. Instead, Mark quotes a prophecy about the forerunner for Christ. Not about Christ, but he talks about the forerunner, somebody else, the spokesman for Christ, which is John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus. See, the one that Luke described as being filled with the Holy Spirit while his mother Elizabeth's womb and leaping for joy when Elizabeth found out that her cousin Mary was pregnant with Christ. This is John the Baptist. But the question is, why would Mark, why would Mark speak of someone other than the main character. What's the purpose of a prophecy, a prophecy about John the Baptist? Well, maybe Mark was aware of the audience that would be reading this letter. Those who would read or hear about this. See, keep in mind who he's writing to, which is the Roman believers and unbelievers, and the history and the culture and the tradition that they would have understood it through. See, they would have been familiar with a king being announced of his arrival by a herald prior to the king getting there. So the king wouldn't just show up and say, hey, I'm outside, he's ringing the doorbell. No, somebody's gonna go ahead of the king a few days before him and tell them, hey, the king is coming, and then they would take this message and then they would begin to prepare themselves for the coming of the king. Oh man, y'all get where I'm going with this? Yeah, Christ is coming soon. I'm getting ahead of my message. But yes, prepare the way for the king. Get your house in order. This is what they would have been accustomed to. And so, see, kings didn't announce themselves on arrival. They sent someone days ahead. So, with this being said, if there was a skeptic Gentile reader of this letter, and they said that they were unaware of this coming king, no one's ever heard of this, Mark could say, Oh, by the way, yes, there was one crying in the wilderness, John the Baptist. You would have heard of him. You would have heard this message. You would have heard about him. And actually, not just John the Baptist, but you would have been aware of Isaiah the prophet and how he spoke of him. So they were without no excuse. However, they know about John the Baptist and his proclamation in the wilderness, but, the, but now John is dead. John is no more. There is now nobody crying in the wilderness about the soon coming king. But does that mean that John's message is dead? 
that his message no longer exists? What I'm asking is, who was now the forerunner for Christ? Who was now carrying this torch? Who was carrying this baton? I believe that's us. We now should be carrying this baton that John used to carry. We should now be telling the, the world about the good news, the soon coming king. But oftentimes we forget. And we think it's just the job of the pastor, but no, the Lord has also equipped us saints, this body, to do the work of the ministry. But moving forward, we see in verse 4, who is John? And we see now the fulfillment of the prophecy beginning in verse 4. John the Baptist appearing in the wilderness. Now, brothers and sisters, let's get this straight before we go on. Just in case y'all thought that Baptist was John's last name, it's not. <laughs> Baptist was not John's last name. You know, I, I, you know what, they, I used to believe this too. Somebody tricked me one time. I said, what's John's last name? Obviously, it's Baptist. I'm like, brother, you're wrong. But no, in the Greek translation, man, John is called, he is called John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer. And so they associated what someone did, and that's how they gave them their name. And so they would add on to somebody's name. If you would remove the last name, they would add on the attributes or the characteristics uh, or somebody's relative who they associated themselves with often. And that became that person's name. And so since baptism is what the community associated most with John, naturally that's actually, that's what stuck. So what he did on a consistent basis is what they tagged him as. Now I would give y'all the exercise to remove your last names and ask yourself, what would they tag me as? What would my last name be? What is it that I do that society or the community knows of me that I do consistently, and what would that be? Would it be good? Would it be bad? Would it be pleasing to the Lord? Or would it be displeasing? Would it be something that I could, I could be proud of? Or would it be something that's more condemning of my own character? I don't have to call the road. You can probably think about some things. But ask yourself that. What would your last name be? And that's pretty humbling, by the way. And so we ought to be mindful of that. Like, man, people know us by our fruit. Scripture says that. You should know them by their fruit. Galatians 5. And so are we in the works of the flesh? Or are we showing fruit by the spirit which we ought to live by? And so since that's what John did, that's what they labeled John as. And so now, one may be thinking, well, Brother Joseph, didn't everybody baptize in the day? Well, no, actually they didn't baptize. It wasn't a common act. See, there were no baptistries, there were no churches, there were no Sunday baptisms, none of that was even existing. The only sort of baptism that they would have been more familiar with, it was a symbolic event. See, there would have been a baptism for a Gentile that wanted to worship the true and living God. Then the Jews would take the Gentiles and baptize them into Judaism. It's called pros proselyte baptism. That's what happened. And so it was not a common activity. And so you can imagine why they gave John this name, because what he practiced was something that was unusual and uncommon during that time. Now, moving forward, in verse 4, John's actions of baptizing, but John also had an action of preaching. See, he preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Remember, the job of a forerunner is to prepare the way, to lay the ground, or to build a bridge for the one who is to follow and to prepare the people for his arrival. And so what's the best way for them to prepare for this king? Well, they got to heed to the message of the forerunner which was to repent of their sins and to be baptized. See, they needed to be forgiven, just like we all need to be forgiven. But now being baptized didn't cleanse them 
nor does it cleanse us. See, it doesn't, baptism, I don't know what you all believe. Uh, I would assume what you all believe, but baptism, the act doesn't save anybody. The act of baptism only declares our intent. It, de it declares our motivation. It's an outward sign to the world. It's a billboard declaring what we believe and what we hold to. See, it's a demonstration that our sins have been wiped clean and forgiven and that we are now committing ourselves to following God. But keep in mind what I said earlier about the Jews and why they didn't practice baptism, but only baptized Gentiles into, into their religion. Because in this text, we now actually see Jews being baptized. See, those who considered themselves once the elite, the Jews, we now see them humbling themselves. See, we're now seeing them through baptism saying that they are no longer better than the Gentile. And you got you to imagine yourself. Now, the Jews really considered themselves the elite. They did not want to associate with a Gentile, didn't even want to touch one. And so for them to go down through the act of baptism says a lot. They are saying, man, I am, I am now leaving my old self. It's like Romans chapter 6, the believer's baptism. They now believe, you know, I'm going down in the grave, this old man, and now I'm coming up a new man. My old body is no more, and now I've been reconciled to God, and now I've also been reconciled to God's people. See, salvation isn't just us in, in good standing with God. But no, we are in reconciliation and community now with God's people, in covenant with one another. And so the Christian life is not our isolated lifestyle. It's a community now of new believers. Mm. So talk about humility, talking about killing yourself and sinful pride. See, you're now able to identify with the people who you weren't previously inclined toward nor sympathized with. See, all on the basis of the gospel that leads us to recognizing that we are all level at the foot of the cross. All level at the foot of the cross. See, Jews were brought up to despise Gentiles, like I just said, but to think of them as outsiders of the covenant. So for them to be willing to submit to an act that only Gentiles were forced to do, was an admission of their own spiritual bankruptcy. But then notice where this was taking place. It wasn't in a church. It wasn't in a baptismal pool. It was in the wilderness. You ever stop to wonder why these folks were leaving their homes to travel to a desolate place without any amenities? One commentator said it this way. He says, to be baptized in the Jordan, in the wilderness, meant that Israel must once again leave and come to the wilderness for salvation. The people are called to a second exodus in preparation for a new covenant with God. To go back to the wilderness signifies Israel's acknowledgement of their rebellion and their desires to start over. That's good news right there. But then we see in verse 5, it's not that we see the actions, the baptism, and the preaching, but we also must understand and see the content of John's preaching. What was he talking about? See, this message of John was so impactful that now we see in verse 5 that all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going to him and being baptized in the Jordan. What in the world was John preaching that was so potent, that was so exciting, that was so much of a drawing force that it caused people to come and hear about this guy? Multitudes of people. The Gospel of Luke would tell us that all John preached was judgment. He called people a brood of vipers and said that the wrath was coming. John would be the equivalent of a fire and brimstone preacher. He didn't care, man. He said, I got one thing to do, and I'm going to do that one thing. I'm not going to tickle your ears. I'm not going to say any cliche sayings. I'm not going to be soft about it. I'm not going to beat around the bush. It probably wouldn't work in today's time, but however, it worked then. 
John was straight to the point, straight, no chaser, period. But no, he made it quite plain and clear. He said, God is coming to judge this world soon with fire. He is coming with a winnowing fork, separating the wheat from the chaff. And so I would highly suggest to you, this is John, I would highly suggest to you that you repent and be saved. Get your house in order is what John would say. And he believed that the word of God would not go out and return back void, but it will accomplish what it was set out to do. And that was John's philosophy of ministry, to plant and to water, but he trusted that God would give the increase. And that's a good philosophy of ministry for all of us to have, that we would not be worried about whether or not we can actually draw somebody to Christ, that we can force somebody to give a response, a, a profession of faith, because that's not our job. We must be concerned with simply planting the gospel, watering the gospel, and then praying for the individual, and then going about our business to do it again with somebody else. But trusting and knowing that God, if he has called somebody, will do the work to draw them. And that's all John was worried about. Why? Because he knew that somebody was coming behind him to do the rest of it. But let's just not stop there. We see what John's doing. We see what John's preaching and why he's preaching. But let's look at how John is dressed. You'd be like, man, it definitely wasn't chic. Verse 6. John was dressed in camel's hair, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. Mark tells us this style of dress. John was looking crazy, let's just be honest. If we read this, we say, John looked crazy. He didn't dress like a normal person in this day and time. And if we saw, I used an illustration with, with Chuck earlier, I said, if y'all saw Chuck walking down the street in a robe made of animal hair, deer hair, and a, uh, and a, and a belt, and some, some flip-flops, eating a, 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 some fried locusts on a stick, and holding a mason jar of honey. Y'all would look like, man, something is wrong with Chuck. You would not probably even get near him, but you would stay across the street at your distance, and be like, Chuck, you all right? You, okay. Man, let's call somebody for Chuck real quick. Matter of fact, let's just pray for Chuck at a distance. Yeah, we would look at like, man, no, he needs to be in a suit, some slacks, a, a button-down shirt or something like that. However, that wouldn't have been the mentality of this period in time right here. Because in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, it gives us the description, excuse me, of a prophet. And it gives us the description of, pro, of Elijah the prophet, the Tishbite, because it says that he was dressed in a hairy garment. He wore a leather girdle around his waist. And in Zechariah chapter 13, it talks about false prophets who desire to deceive by putting on hairy robes or garments. And then his diet was very, very similar to the Nazarite diet. But here's the, but listen to this. This is why Jesus says that beware of false prophets because they come in sheep's clothing and they inwardly, they are like ravenous wolves. That's where that term comes from because they wanted to deceive people in thinking that they were actually prophets, but they really weren't. It wasn't real sheep's clothing, no. They were talking about dressing up like the prophets. It was an analogy. And so John was more concerned with being associated with the prophets and the people would have known what he was doing. And so they didn't look at him like, no, he was crazy. He was wild. He's out of his mind. No, they said, okay, this brother is trying, well, he looks like a prophet. We're going to assume that he's a prophet. That's why he dressed the way he did, because he wanted to make a line of demarcation. John wasn't concerned about what people thought about him, how he dressed, about what he ate, about what he preached, and how we talked. He was concerned about the mission, and we should be able to take note of that and apply it to our own lives and ask ourselves the question, well, what are we concerned with? What is it about our own lives that, pri that we prioritize over the ministry of God? Does our dress game matter? Do we spend more time with how we dress? 
Do we spend more time, are we worried about how we look, how we appear to the world? Do we concern ourselves with, well, some should be concerned with what they eat because y'all might get sick. Let me not say that. But the point is, what are we prioritizing over God who should be the highest priority? How concerned are we with appealing to the world, with appealing to society? What do we give our time and our efforts to? And is God on the top of that list? This was the example of John. Christ, God, was such at the top of his list that that is all he was concerned about. And you couldn't tell John anything about that mission. That's, that, that is it. Whew. Yeah, I'm preaching to myself because it's so easy in this world to be concerned about every single thing else in this world and not God's mission and not his agenda. And so we must always pray and examine ourselves to see whether or not we are of the faith and see whether or not the mission of the day is it going to glorify God. Whether you're in the classroom, whether you're on the job, it doesn't really matter what it is. Are we glorifying him in all that we do? In all that we do. And so John was not worried about the greed. He wasn't about trying to be arrogant, wasn't trying to be prideful. No, we are not called to be puppets. We're called to be like John, prophets of the day. We don't march to society's drum. We don't do that. But we ought to live contrary to the values of what this world deems as important. But not only that, we see John's humility. We see John's humility through his message and through his dress. So after John preaches his message, he now actually turns to a different subject. It's as if John was like, all right, y'all, I preach my message. I preach it lots of times. I've seen a lot of people come to repentance through my ministry. But there's this one brother who's coming after me, and he's a, he's a bad boy. He's pretty tough. He's the type of guy that I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Mm -hmm. Now, what I use on you is water. But this man, he's going to use something even greater than what I have to offer. See, this is the sum of John's ministry right here. This is the point of the forerunner. He points to Christ, not himself. John, if he were jealous, John could have said, hey, man, you know, Jesus, he's all right. He's okay. You know, being baptized with the Spirit is not much of an upgrade than water. It's really not. No, he doesn't say that. But rather, it's John 3, verse 30 that says that John must decrease and Christ must increase. He said, I must get out the way and give Jesus the forefront. That's what he's saying. Again, John is not worried about being identified as the man. He's not worried about being identified as the best preacher in town or having the best church and nobody else is doing it but him. That's not his concern. His concern is to proclaim what thus saith the Lord. His concern is to maintain the dignity of the office, hand the baton over, and get out the way. That's his concern. And so our concern should be very, very similar to be concerned about the mission, the message, and the proclamation, to disciple other believers, to grow them in the faith, pass the baton over and get out the way and let them do their thing. See, John was so humble that he considered himself unfit to untie Jesus' sandals. See, the lowest job that any servant or slave at that time could have was untying the shoes of their master. John said he's so wretched that he doesn't even deserve to do that. John convicts me because he challenges me to ask myself the question, am I worthy of Christ? Do I feel like I'm worthy to untie his shoes? Am I worthy of all that he has given me? And even if I can say that no, I am actually not worthy of him, do my actions and do my words say otherwise? Am I acting prideful and arrogant? Do I come off like I'm entitled? Or am I constantly trying to walk in a posture of humility and contentment and grace and have an attitude of gratitude towards Christ? 
But why is this posture of humility so important as it relates to John and to us? Because John said in verse 8 that all he can simply do is stick you in the water. But what Jesus can do and will do is transform your life. That's why. In and of ourselves, we cannot transform anybody, but we must be able to point them to the person that can transform their lives. The transforming work of the Holy Spirit is what John is constantly pointing to. Given only through the relationship with Jesus the King. See, Jesus will give us, will give you the Holy Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit comes salvation. With salvation comes sanctification, and with sanctification comes good works, beloved. See, but you can only partake of this King's glorious gift if you believe that out of the abundance of God's love that he has sent his son to this earth to fulfill the law by living a completely sinless life and that he is willing and has given himself as a bloody sacrifice on the cross, paying the ransom for all of our sins since the fall of Adam. And also believing that he was buried and placed in a borrowed man's tomb and on the third appointed morning he rose up shattering the chains of death and establishing the new covenant of grace that we live under. But not only that, but you got to believe that he has ascended into the heavens and sits at the right hand of the Father. And that he has sent his helper, the Holy Spirit, that John spoke of. And that spirit today indwells every single believer this morning. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's the banner that we raise and that we live under and that we submit to. That's what we proclaim to the world. So I ask you this morning, that as you leave here, Parents, siblings, teachers, friends, spouses, coaches, visitors, whoever you are, when you leave here this morning, we must examine ourselves and ask ourselves the question, what kind of forerunner am I? What kind of forerunner am I? Am I leading people? Am I leading my family in such a way that they see a clear path to Christ and clear path to godliness and not to myself? Or is it the opposite? Because pointing to a beautiful family is fine. Pointing to accumulate degrees is good. Having a nice job good. Pointing to, to build wealth. Pointing to good health. All that's good. But when you point to Christ, it's the best thing that one could do. Eternal life is forever and ever. And when you do that, point to them, then you have chosen the best thing. And why do we do all this? I believe the answer is in verse 5. In hopes that unbelievers will come away from their idols, asking what must they do to be saved. That if they would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart, that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example that you have laid out for us. In, in the work of John the Baptist, Father. Father, humble us now. By your word, convict us by your word, challenge by, by your word. Father, grow us by your spirit in your word. May we trust in you, God. And may we be bold to proclaim your good news to the world, to the unbelieving world, God. Knowing and trusting that you will sanctify them in the truth and that if we would plant and water, that you would give the increase. We love you, Father. In Christ's name we pray, amen.